Okay, in part two of this video, we're going to use Gauss's law to find the electric field everywhere for this uh, distribution of charge. It's spherically symmetric, has total charge Q, and the charge density as a function of radius is given by this expression. It has a uh, density at the center equal to 3Q over pi r cubed, and it decreases linearly to zero as the radius goes to, cap the R goes to uh, capital R. All right, and so to find the electric field everywhere, we find we have to break this up into two parts. The first part is going to be for the uh, distance from the center greater than capital R. So we're going to utilize Gauss's law. And so to do Gauss's law, we need the electric field dotted into the area element. And so for a Gaussian surface, dA n hat. So the Gaussian surface we want to use is going to utilize the symmetry of the system. So we have this spherical symmetry. So we're going to choose, let's erase this line here, a Gaussian surface. <laughs> That's, okay, my drawing may not be a, a really great circle, but we want a, a Gaussian surface that's a that's a spherical shell of radius r that's centered on the same origin of the charge distribution. So our Gaussian surface contains the same symmetry as our charge distribution. So we know that the field of a charge distribution must also have the same symmetry as the charge distribution. And so that tells us that the electric field at this surface everywhere must be the same magnitude and must point radially. And so we know, uh, we know that because, because it's symmetric with respect to any type of rotation. If you rotate the object, the electric field has to look the same everywhere. So on this cylindric, this spherical Gaussian surface, the electric field has the same magnitude and it points radially, either inward or outward, depending on whether this is a positive or negative charge. Okay, we're going to see that, let's say the charge is positive, so it points radially outward. All right, so for this Gaussian surface, we also know that this, uh, the n is perpendicular to the surface everywhere and points out. So it also points radially everywhere on the surface. Therefore, we see immediately that this dot, the, the vectors are this, these vectors, the electric field at every area element dA is parallel to the normal vector at that area element. And so we just get the magnitude of the field times dA. Also critical is that the magnitude is the same everywhere around the surface. So this dot product simplifies greatly and immediately. And so now we can integrate this over the entire Gaussian surface, E dA. Since this is a constant, we just pull that out and we get a surface integral over the, the entire surface, which is just the area E times the area, and the area of a, uh, a, a sphere, the surface area of a sphere, then four pi r squared. So this Gaussian surface is at a distance r from the center. Okay, Gauss's law tells this, that this, uh, this integral which is the total flux, is equal to the charge enclosed in the Gaussian surface divided by epsilon naught. Well, the charge enclosed in this Gaussian surface is simply the total charge, Q. So now we can solve for the electric field, which is uh, Q, total charge, 4 pi epsilon naught, distance squared, or in terms of k, if we want it, k q over r squared is the magnitude points radially out, uh, outward, which is also point charge, you will remember. In fact, <laughs> that's just worth remembering now. <laughs> Anytime you have a spherically symmetric charge distribution, the electric field outside the region where the charge is will always go like a point charge 
at the center of the charge distribution that's equal to the total amount of charge. And we don't in fact have to go through all that work again. All right, so that's the region R greater than capital R. So let's now look at the uh, other region where R is less than or equal to uh, capital R. Okay, so in this case we have this, the uh, the flux integral. Well, let's let's bring our let's bring our let's do a new picture here. Here we have our charge distribution, and so in this case we want a Gaussian surface still utilizing the symmetry. So it's the surface of a sphere. And, but it has some r now that's less than the radius of the object. Okay, so the, the first thing that we can do is calculate the flux, and that is identical to before. Nothing, nothing is different now with the analysis that we had before. The electric field must be uh, spherically symmetric, so it's the same magnitude everywhere and points radially outward and of course the n hat of our element is radially outward everywhere and so we just get e da and the total flux then which is the total integral of this is just again electric field times the area e which is 4 pi r squared okay so so that's all the same and this uh, this integral now is equal to the charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught. But the charge enclosed by the Gaussian surface is no longer the total charge. It is the charge enclosed in this particular surface at some arbitrary value of small r that's less than the radius of the object. So some amount of charge less than the total charge is enclosed in this Gaussian surface. Okay, so we have to calculate that, the charge enclosed. Now this we find is going to lead us down the exact same type of, of mathematical problem we did when we, when we uh, in part one, where we integrated over the entire thing. So we have some uh, volume integral of our density uh, function as a function of r dv and it's now the volume of this uh, Gaussian surface okay so this is now an integral from 0 to some fixed but arbitrary r of well I'll just put a so I don't have to uh, simplify this is sort of have to write all those constants I will just use a for now uh, times 1 minus r, and I'm going to call this r prime over capital R, and then our volume element, which we did in part one, which is 4 pi r prime squared dr prime. So what what is this y prime? Um, the, the r here that it is called prime is the r, the uh, coordinate that I am integrating over. So this I'm integrating from r prime equals zero to r prime equal to some small r. And so I'm distinguishing it from my integration variable r from my uh, limit of integration r, which is an arbitrary but fixed distance from the center. Okay. But now the, the uh, math just follows as before. So 4 pi a and then integral 0 to fixed r of r prime squared minus r prime cubed capital R dr prime. So I have two polynomials. I know how to integrate them. So r prime cubed over 3 minus r prime to the fourth over 4 capital R evaluated at 0 and this fixed radius r. Okay, so uh, the zeros give me zero, and so I'm just at this fixed uh, but arbitrary r cubed over 3 minus r to the fourth over 4r. 
All right. So, um, let's see. Okay, I have a whole lot of red here. So this is the total charge enclosed. And so Gauss's law tells me that this divided by epsilon naught is equal to the total flux, which is here. So that's 4, we calculated that before, e, 4 pi r squared. All right, so the uh, 4 pi's cancel. And then I'm going to substitute in for a. And then, so, well, the r squareds give me, here's just an r. And then that's an r squared. And so the electric field then is equal to a over epsilon naught times r over 3 minus r squared over 4 r. Uh, you know, I could, you know, let's, let's substitute in for a, get it in terms of our total charge. Here we've got 3q over epsilon naught pi capital R cubed and then r over 3 minus uh, r squared over 4 capital R. You know, and, and this might be good enough. We, we might think about simplifying that a little bit. We could multiply the 3 through, and it would cancel that one, and I'd get a 3 here. Uh, I could also then, you know, I've got a 4 pi epsilon naught here, so if outside. So if I say multiply that by 4 over 4, then I could pull out a 4 here, and then I have a, a 4 pi epsilon naught I could turn into a k. So if, if I wanted to look at it, I could say it was also uh, kq over the radius cubed, and now I have 4 times r minus 3 r squared over r. I, don't know if this is better than than looking at it this way, but but we can see it at uh, um, d depending on how you want to calculate it. The one thing we do need to do, and this is a very important check. You always do this when you have this type of problem. We calculated the electric field in two regions of space: one where it's a greater than r, and the other where it's less than or equal to r, and the check that you always make when you do this sort of thing is you verify that these two are equal at the electric field equal to R. So if I plug R into this one, I get KQ R cubed 4 R minus 3 R, right? If I put a capital R in here, I cancel one of them, I get 3R. So this just gives me 1R. That 1R cancels one of those, KQR squared, and it checks out. Uh, you always want to check your work to, to see that you're on the right track, and this is the sort of obvious check that you always make. If you calculate something in two regions of space, and you know that it has to be continuous, you make sure that they're equal to each other at the boundary.